Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So I hope you guys enjoyed my April Fools video last week. For those who were fooled, let me give you my apologies. And for those who weren't fooled, well, I'll get you next year. Anyways, picture this. You are a hair loss newcomer who has just discovered that you have antigenic alopecia. You are now faced with the reality that you're going to have to make a very important decision. Either get on finasteride or go bald. I know that may seem like a sobering reality for many, especially with all the misinformation online about the drug that makes taking the red pill to fight hair loss such a tough pill to swallow. But the fact is, is that finasteride is the only treatment that is clinically proven to stop hair loss indefinitely. When you really think about it though, it really is a no-brainer decision. On one hand, you have a 100% chance of going bald by abstaining from finasteride, and on the other hand, you have the choice of saving your hair by taking finasteride. Yes, I know you're all thinking, but what about the side effects, bro? Yes, of course, finasteride, just like any other drug in the market, has side effects. The most comprehensive evidence-based data on finasteride shows that finasteride has a risk of side effects of about 2% greater than placebo. So already, we're talking about a very, very low risk of side effects. And even for those who do get side effects, the research shows that these side effects are acute and will usually go away with continued use of the drug, and they will always go away with cessation of the drug. For the few people who do continue to get side effects after the first several months of usage, they can easily mitigate these side effects by reducing their dosage of the drug below the standard dose of 1 milligram per day. 0.5 milligrams or 0.2 milligrams of finasteride used daily or even every other day can still be very effective, and I talk about all this in my optimal dose of finasteride video, which is linked below. So there are plenty of great options for people who don't respond well to the standard dose of finasteride, and I have some additional tips for people who do get side effects in my what to do if you get side effects on finasteride video, which of course is linked below. But when we're talking about finasteride side effects, it is very important that we contextualize what type of side effects we're talking about exactly. Finasteride side effects, they fall into three different categories. The first category is the real side effects. These are side effects that we know are real because in the randomized controlled clinical trial, there was a greater incidence of them in the finasteride group compared to the control group. These real side effects include things like low libido, erectile dysfunction, and reduced ejaculatory volume. Again, these side effects are rare, but they are real and finasteride can cause them. There's no denying that. The second category of finasteride side effects is the theoretical side effects. These are the type of side effects where the research is inconclusive and it would include things like dry eyes and sleep disorders. I've made videos on both of these subjects, which I'll link below, but we don't have enough data one way or the other to say for sure if these side effects are real or if they're not real. The bottom line though is that it is still debatable about whether finasteride has any causative role in these types of problems, but even if it does, these side effects have to be exceptionally rare since they were not reported reported on in any of the clinical trials, which included thousands of subjects. Finally, the last category is fake side effects. These are the type of side effects that we know aren't real because they're either based on bad data or no data at all. This would include reflex hyperandrogenicity, which is a fake condition that the hair loss forms and subreddits literally made up one day in order to try to explain their shedding after taking treatment since they're obviously self-medicating and never had a doctor actually explain to them why shedding from a treatment is actually a sign that the drug is working. And of course, there's also post-finasteride syndrome, which we know is a fake condition because it blames finasteride for any condition that happens to occur in anyone who ever took finasteride at any time in their life. For example, if you develop erectile dysfunction and you took one finasteride tablet five years before, you will be welcomed into the post-finasteride syndrome community with open arms and they'll believe everything you say. All the research on post-finasteride syndrome is basically just a big fishing expedition that is desperately trying to identify a mechanism that could explain how a drug that is long out of the system could possibly be causing permanent side effects. No plausible mechanism can be identified. So instead, the PFS Foundation funds studies with subjects selected from their forums complaining of depression or erectile dysfunction. They then compare these subjects to completely normal people in their studies. So they find that people with depression are more depressed than normal people, and people with erectile dysfunction have more erectile dysfunction than people without erectile dysfunction. Big fucking surprise, huh? But none of these studies establish an 
in any way that their depression or erectile dysfunction had anything at all to do with taking finasteride at some time in the past, sometimes even years before. This is definitely a familiar subject on my channel. And in fact, I've made an entire video series on why post-finasteride syndrome is a fake condition, and I'll link that series below. But let's concentrate now on another fake side effect of finasteride, and that's the drug's supposed neurological side effects. I know we hear people often talk about things like finasteride and my neurosteroids or my brain fog. So what's that all about? The theory behind this is that the 5-air enzyme doesn't just cause the conversion of testosterone into the trash hormone DHT that destroys our hair follicles. The 5-air enzyme is involved in a lot of other reactions. Specifically, it is one of the steps in the production of 3-alpha, 5-alpha tetrahydroprogesterone, otherwise known as the neurosteroid allopregnanolum. We know that allopregnanolone acts on a specific type of neurons in the brain, which use the neurotransmitter known as GABA GABA. We also know that allopregnanolone is synthesized in the brain from progesterone in a two step process that involves the type 1 5 air isoenzyme and the enzyme 3 alpha hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. These two enzymes are present in large amounts in these GABA neurons, and so the allopregnanolone that regulates the function of these neurons is produced right in the brain. Just like the DHT that damages the hair follicles is produced by the type 2 5 air isoenzyme right in the hair follicles. So these hormones are known as paracrine hormones, meaning they act locally on nearby cells, or autocrine hormones, meaning they act directly on the cells that produce them. Basic research studies show that allopregnanolone is a paracrine and autocrine hormone in the brain, meaning it is produced and works locally in the brain itself. So just like it is scalp DHT and not serum DHT that is important for causing androgenic alopecia. It is brain allopregnanolone and not serum allopregnanolone that is important for causing depression or other neurological symptoms. It is also important to realize that this is a type 1 5-air isoenzyme and not the type 2 isoenzyme that creates allopregnanolone in the brain. That's important because finasteride is a very, very weak blocker of the type 1 5-air isoenzyme while it is a strong type 2 5-air isoenzyme blocker. So, even on a theoretical basis here, there isn't any reason to believe finasteride would cause neurological side effects like depression or steroids and brain fog. These so-called neurological side effects are nocebo-induced delusions because we know enough about finasteride's mechanism of action to realize that these side effects are not possible. Despite this, and despite the fact that neurological side effects were not even reported in the original clinical studies of finasteride that involved thousands of subjects, and despite the fact that men born with the deficiency of the type 2 5-air isoenzyme have not been ever reported to have an increased incidence of depression or cognitive problems. Despite all that overwhelming evidence, people are still convinced that finasteride causes neurological side effects like depression or brain fog. In order to try to prove this, some researchers have decided to examine large post-marketing databases of drug side effects for evidence. In one of my recent videos, I talked about one of those databases called the FAERS FAERS database. The FAERS database includes side effects reported by patients and doctors in the United States, but there is an even larger database managed by the World Health Organization. It is called Vigibase, and it contains millions of reports of adverse reactions from drugs. Recently, some researchers have been mining this database to look at the incidence of finasteride side effects. One of these database articles was mentioned recently in a Reddit post that one of my viewers brought to my attention a couple of months ago. It's this article here titled, quote, Cognitive Dysfunction Following Finasteride Use, a Disproportionality Analysis of the Global Pharmacovigilance Database. Unquote. Well, when I went to get the full version of this article, I confronted this massive paywall right in front of me. It's as large as the one I encountered in my April Fool's video, in fact. But this is nothing my Witcher signs and alchemy cannot defeat. So let's give it a touch of the Yurden sign and douse it with some dimeridium and poof, the paywall is gone. All hair loss knowledge now officially belongs to me and my viewers. So here's the article. So the good news is that this article is from Good Korea, which is home to some of the best hair loss research in the world. Unfortunately, the bad news is that it is another fucking database study. Finasteride fear mongers absolutely love doing rat studies and database studies, but they can't be bothered to do the one type of study that can actually establish causation and prove that post-finasteride syndrome is real, specifically randomized controlled studies. They hate them for some reason. Anyways, the article starts out parroting the PFS party line that, quote, the suppression of 5A reductase by finasteride can reduce the synthesis 
synthesis of my neurosteroids in the brain, thereby altering cognition, mood, and libido, unquote. Like I said, there is no evidence that finasteride acts like this in the human brain. Also, in the introduction to the article, the researchers cite some other database studies that suggest that finasteride could cause depression and other cognitive problems. However, they then reference two randomized controlled studies that specifically tested for cognitive dysfunction with finasteride, and those two studies were both negative, meaning there was no evidence of finasteride causing any cognitive dysfunction. But let's get into the actual study. Like I said, this study uses the Vigibase database, which records side effects reported by patients and their healthcare providers. Like the FAERS database, it is not a validated database, meaning that no one actually checks to see if the supposed side effects are clearly related to the use of any particular drug. Nevertheless, it is a very large database that contains data collected from 1967 to the present, and it contains more than 30 million reports of possible drug side effects throughout the world. So. What the investigators did here was that they did something called a disproportionality analysis. What that means is that the investigators looked at the percentage of finasteride users who complained of cognitive problems like brain fog or depression, and they compared that percentage to the percentage of users of other drugs who had the same problems. Although this sounds like a valid type of analysis, there are some researchers who are skeptical of disproportionality analysis, like in this article here. The problem is that the quality of the data in a database can vary a lot, and disproportionality Proportionality analysis doesn't take this into account. But let's put that aside for a moment and look at the actual results. So in the database of over 30 million reports of side effects, the investigators found 54,766 side effects from finasteride overall. Of all the side effects reported from finasteride, 1,624 were reports of cognitive problems. That's 2.97% of all finasteride side effects, which is a pretty small number if you consider that in most finasteride clinical studies, the overall incidence of side effects was about 4% versus 2% for placebo. 2.97% of 4% is only 0.12% of people taking finasteride. So that's a little over one out of a thousand users reporting cognitive side effects. It's very likely that the percentage isn't too different from the incidence of cognitive problems in the general population of people not taking finasteride, but let's see if even that percentage is valid. Let's get back to the study results. So the main result of the study was that the odds of getting cognitive dysfunction on finasteride were 5.43 times greater than with other drugs. So that sounds like a lot, but let's take a look at some some of the details because some of the details are really odd. This table looks at how some parameters like age, finasteride dose, and diagnosis affected the results. It's remarkable that reports of cognitive problems were only increased in men taking finasteride for androgenic alopecia. If anything, the risk of cognitive problems was less than other drugs in men taking it for benign prostatic hyperplasia. It's also remarkable that men taking the one milligram dose had more cognitive problems than those taking the higher five milligram dose. Also, Younger men, meaning men younger than 45 years old, were the only ones that had a higher than expected risk of cognitive problems. That's really strange because with most drugs, the incidence of side effects increases with older age and with higher doses of the drug. With finasteride, the opposite was true. So how the fuck does that make any sense? Spoiler alert, it doesn't make any sense. Even more strange though, is that dutasteride was also looked at and it did not increase the risk of cognitive problems at all. That's especially strange here because if anything, you would expect dutasteride to be more likely to cause cognitive problems than finasteride. That is because dutasteride is a much stronger 5 error blocker, but more importantly, unlike finasteride, dutasteride actually does block the type 1 5 error isoenzyme to a significant degree, which is the enzyme in the brain that synthesizes neurosteroids like allopregnanolone. But despite this, dutasteride still did not cause an increase in cognitive dysfunction. So if dutasteride, which is 100 times stronger at blocking the type 1 5 error isoenzyme than finasteride doesn't affect my neurosteroids, then how in the hell is finasteride supposed to? But let's go ahead and investigate these results further. In this table here, we see some more interesting findings. What we're looking at here is all the subjects that reported cognitive problems on finasteride. Like the other table showed, most of the reports are from younger men with androgenic alopecia who are taking one milligram of finasteride daily. It's really notable to me that the vast majority of these cases, 89% in fact, happened after the year 2012, and only 6% of these cases were reported before the year 2012. So what makes the year 2012 so especially notable here is that 2012 is the year that the FDA 
PTA changed the package insert of Propecia and Proscar to mention the possibility of long-term sexual side effects. This change in the labeling had nothing at all to do with any actual scientific data. This change was made after an absolute onslaught of media reports and litigation happened against Merck, and so the FDA added this language to the package insert, even though the FDA also clearly stated that a link between these drugs and persistent sexual side effects had not been established. So it seems like this change in the package insert, as well as the rise of anti-finasteride organizations like the PFS Foundation, led to a huge increase of people reporting cognitive problems from finasteride use due to the, all the social media contagion. It's also interesting that the vast majority of the reports came from the USA, 79% of them in fact. At the same time, there were zero reports of cognitive problems from finasteride use coming from Southeast Asian countries or Eastern Mediterranean countries. So basically, Chums, the results of the study are exactly what you would expect to see with a placebo side effect aggravated by constant negative social media posts and rampant fear-mongering online. If this was a real side effect, you'd expect to see it more in older men on a higher dose of the drug, but it was the opposite that was seen in the study. You'd also expect it to occur with detasteride use too, but again, that was not seen at all either. One other finding in the study was that most of the men reporting cognitive dysfunction also complained of sexual dysfunction and anxiety or depression. Also, the majority reported that their cognitive dysfunction was persistent and severe. So, from all this, we can assume that many of these reports are from people claiming to have post-finasteride syndrome, which means that many of these people had stopped finasteride and weren't even on finasteride when they reported these symptoms. That means that many of the subjects were blaming their symptoms on finasteride without any evidence that finasteride was causing their symptoms. It's interesting that cognitive problems were never reported in the original clinical trials of finasteride from the 1990s that included thousands of subjects, yet all of a sudden a few media reports about post-finasteride syndrome come out and now suddenly people are talking about it left and right. That goes back to what I said earlier about social media contagion causing placebo-induced delusions in the masses. The two randomized control trials looking at cognitive testing and finasteride that I mentioned before showed no evidence of cognitive impairment with finasteride use despite having thousands of subjects. Also, an increase in cognitive problems has not been reported in men born with a genetic deficiency of the 5AR type 2 isoenzyme. So I think what this study shows is that the vast explosion of reports about post-finasteride syndrome and fake finasteride side effects like brain fog that occurred in the last 10 years or so is merely a consequence of all the incessant fear-mongering online and social media contagion about the drug. So simply put, cognitive side effects from finasteride like depression, brain fog, anhedonia, etc. are all completely fake. I'm not not saying that people who experience these conditions are lying, but their issues are being caused by factors other than finasteride, and the longer they continue to try to blame finasteride for their problems, the harder it is going to be for them to find real help. So I know I am not exactly the most popular figure in the PFS community, but if you're amongst that community and you've gotten this far in the video, then at least hear me out for a bit longer and let me ask you something very important. Do you really think that anti-finasteride organizations like the PFS Foundation or PFS Network even want you to get better? These organizations rely on donations from people like you, people who believe that these fake side effects like post-finasteride syndrome are both real and permanent. So, if you seek proper help for your issues and get better as a consequence of it, then you hurt the credibility of these anti-finasteride organizations. So naturally, they don't want you to get better, and that's why they keep telling you that these conditions are permanent and that the only hope for you is to give money to their organization so that they maybe can find a cure 50 years from now. That's why they stabbed Ryan Russo in the back after propping him up as a celebrity for their cause for several months. It's all just because he had the audacity to actually try to solve his own problems on his own accord, and they couldn't tolerate that. So why try to seek help from people who don't want you to get better? When you guys tell me you have conditions like erectile dysfunction, brain fog, depression, or other cognitive effects that occurred after taking finasteride, I believe you. When you tell me these things persisted after stopping finasteride, I still believe you because these conditions can be persistent by their very nature. But they were not caused by finasteride. And the sooner you accept that red pill reality that your problems are not caused by finasteride, the sooner you can actually seek out proper medical or mental health. Finasteride haters don't want you to get better though because your suffering benefits them. All right, I think that's all for today, Chooms. Thank you for watching. God bless.